Uh, let me open in prayer, shall I? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your kindness and faithfulness, and do pray, Lord, that uh, you might uh, be with us this morning as we meet together, and we pray, Father, that we would uh, uh, know the Holy Spirit uh, with us in uh, all of our different uh, homes. Uh, Father, be with Dave especially as he speaks to the children and opens your word later in the service, and Father, pray that will be a real blessing to all of us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we oh, there's one thing I forgot to, to do uh, in my uh, welcomes. Um, so uh, those of you who are on the Bethel WhatsApp group will already know uh, of this welcome. Uh, so this is Alfred uh, with his cousins. Uh, so Liz and Tim's uh, Alfred is now named and at home. Uh, so we can thank God uh, for, uh, for him. There we are. Well, we're going to uh, sing a hymn together, and uh, that hymn is Mighty Christ from Time Eternal. a day off this morning so uh, Dave is going to speak to the children if you can unmute yourself Dave thank you okay that should be working it is yeah that should be working okay um, well good morning all especially uh, to the children um, and um, we've just lost your video Dave <laughs> ah get rid of that yeah my um, things that go into the year because I think the microphone is better and I want to move around. But to show the, the, the children something this morning, probably something I would think that has never been used as a prop in a children's story before. It's uh, probably my favourite ever Christmas present. It is definitely my most manly Christmas present that I've ever received. So I'm going to just grab it. There. And uh, here it is. And it is my chainsaw. Excellent when you're older for cutting trees. Uh, and, uh, and so I've had it for a few years now. I've had to cut down a few trees. You can see one of the trees behind me. I don't think I've ever cut any of that. But you can see, if I show you closely, you can see the chain and you can see the little teeth there which cut everything. 
But let me just show you something else. Here, you can just see there, you can see a little picture there of the teeth of the chain. Let me put that back down. Because um, a couple of uh, weeks ago, one of our trees fell down, got home on a Saturday morning, and uh, I had to cut the tree up. And I remembered that the last time I'd used the chainsaw, it hadn't worked very well. It had taken a while. And so this tree trunk, which was, or branch, was only about that thick. It wasn't that thick. I started to cut it, and after about five minutes, it just wasn't really getting anywhere. It was about kind of a, that much through. And uh, the chain sometimes comes off, and so I put a bit more oil in, and I had a look at the chain. And then I saw the photo on the side of the little picture on the side of the chainsaw to look and to show what the chain should look like. And I suddenly realized the chain was on back to front. I got it the wrong way round. And because of that, uh, a couple of minutes later, I just put, took the chain off, turned it around, put it back on. Literally took me about half a second to saw through the rest of the tree. And uh, I then had great fun chopping up this tree. I got it the wrong way around. What a difference it makes when you get things the right way around. There are lots of stories in the Bible that that applies to, and lots of people in the Bible that applies to. But I won't just tell you just one little story. It's a lovely story of uh, Jesus with a man named Levi. Levi, is, uh, is, his name is actually changed to Matthew in the Bible, so he writes the first gospel. And Levi is a tax collector. He uh, sits on the side of the road in a little kind of hut, and he takes money of everyone who comes past. And uh, he steals money, and he's not very well liked at all, for uh, lots of reasons. And, uh, and Jesus comes to him and calls him and tells Levi, follow me. And Levi does. He gets up, leaves everything behind, including the money, starts to follow Jesus. It shows the change that Jesus makes in this man's life. We're going to look at that bit later on. And what happens next is remarkable. Levi has a great banquet, we're told. A big house, well, of course, Levi's got lots of money, but he's stolen from others. But he puts on this big banquet, other tax collectors and sinners come. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, when they see Jesus with these people, this is the question they ask. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? They're basically saying to Jesus, you've got it wrong. You're doing it the wrong way round. You've got it the wrong way round, Jesus. What are you doing with those people? Jesus, of course, has it the right way round. Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. You only go to the doctor when you're ill, don't you? He says, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus has come to call all of us, and he's come to call us to turn to him. You see, it's so easy that we can get the wrong idea about Jesus, the wrong impression. We get Jesus often the wrong way round. That's what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law did. Jesus has come to save people like us, people who have realized that we've let God down, that we've done things that he doesn't want us to do, that we haven't done things that he does want us to do. And yet Jesus has come and he's turned everything the right way around. And I wonder this morning, doesn't matter how young you are or old you are, uh, has, have you realized the right way around, as it were, for Jesus? What a difference he makes and what a difference it makes when you get things the right way around. Jesus does. He comes and eats with sinners and tax collectors. He comes to deal with people like you and me comes to call us to turn to him. So I wonder if you've done that, and I wonder what things have you got the wrong way around? Have you got Jesus the wrong way around? I trust you haven't. So thanks, children, for listening, and thanks, Mark. Thank you, Dave. Uh, well, we're going to uh, sing a Sunday school song now, and uh, that uh, Sunday school song is Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him.
Pray, let me uh, quickly give you the uh, notices. Uh, do remember that on Sunday the 4th of October at 5 o'clock, uh, we're planning to have a communion service uh, in our uh, building. It'll uh, be great to be back there. Uh, we'd love you to come, uh, but if you uh, do want to come, uh, you need to, to register. Uh, that's to make sure, A, we can do the whole track and trace thing, uh, should that be necessary, uh, but perhaps uh, just as importantly, uh, we need to make sure that everybody is two meters apart. And if we know that you're coming in a group of uh, six, say, if, uh, if you're a big household, uh, or if you're coming just by yourself, if you're uh, living on your own, then uh, we'll uh, arrange the chairs differently. So uh, please do uh, book your place. Uh, there's the link. Uh, I sent that link out by email uh, as well. Uh, I'll try and remember to put it in the WhatsApp group for those of you who are on that. And if you're not on uh, email or you didn't manage to write this down in time, but you would like to come, uh, just send Sharon or me a text uh, or uh, reply to the email um, and let us know how many people uh, will be in your household or extended household uh, who'll be able to sit together for that service and we'll get you booked in. So we're looking forward to that, Sunday the 4th of October. And if you can let us know uh, you're coming by next Sunday, uh, that would be a great help. Uh, 
uh, terms of next Sunday, our preacher next Sunday will be Rodri Brady from Aberystwyth. Uh, that's at 10.30, of course. We'd love to see you there. And then uh, on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, Sam Keane uh, will be back with us. Uh, let me uh, read from the scriptures now. We're going to read from Acts chapter 19, uh, beginning at verse 21. Acts chapter 19, beginning at verse 21. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theatre, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, had sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theatre. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they'd come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defence to the crowd. But when they recognised that he was a Jew... For about two hours, they all cried with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Well, Dave will be speaking from that passage a little bit later and uh, helping us to understand how it speaks very clearly into our situation today. But before we do that, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are thankful uh, that we're able to meet together uh, like this this morning. And we're thankful, Lord, that as we do that, we're able to uh, open your word yeah, and we see these stories of old, uh, and uh, Lord, in some ways, these uh, stories seem very different to our own world. Uh, we have this uh, this goddess uh, who perhaps we've uh, maybe not even even heard of, uh, Artemis. Uh, uh, this uh, worship that's going on, this riot that's happening, uh, Lord, what relevance could that have to our life today? Uh, and yet, as with all of the Bible, we will see just how it speaks uh, into our situation. That these are timeless principles. And Father, we thank you for that. We do pray for Dave as he opens your word later, that you would uh, help him and help us. Uh, we want to uh, pray too, Lord, for uh, one another this morning. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for each person who is uh, gathering, uh, uh, whether we're able to, to see them on Zoom uh, or whether uh, we are able uh, to know that they're with us. Uh, and uh, we want to thank you, Lord, for each one. Those who are uh, watching on YouTube, those who are watching on Facebook, those who will be receiving the DVDs and watching a little bit later um, in the week. Lord, we do thank you for each one. And we do pray, Lord, that each one might know your uh, blessing uh, this morning. 
Uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, Jack is now home and out of hospital. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the way in which you were able to use him in hospital to, to speak to others. And maybe, Lord, that was the very purpose uh, for which he went there. So we thank you for that, Lord. Uh, but we do pray for him and for Margaret and uh, ask, Lord, that uh, uh, as uh, doctors continue to uh, investigate these infections, we pray, Lord, that uh, there might be uh, an end to them uh, and that they wouldn't return again. Uh, we continue, Lord, to pray for uh, Dave Flewellyn and uh, thank you for him, Lord, and uh, thank you for his great faithfulness to you and the, the great example that he is to us so often. And Father, we do pray that uh, you would be near to Dave uh, as he continues his treatment. Uh, we think of uh, others, Lord, uh, such as uh, Betty and Minty, Lord. Uh, we pray for them once again, uh, commit them to you. Uh, and Lord, again, thank you for their faithfulness over such a long time. Uh, we think, Lord, of uh, uh, the many people that we haven't seen uh, for some time. Uh, we use, Lord, uh, in uh, months gone by uh, to pray in for those who are, who are housebound. Uh, but there's a sense, Lord, of course, in which that's much broader uh, than it used to be. And uh, Father, we're glad that we are able to see uh, some, uh, either on Zoom or maybe in the, in the park from week to week. Uh, but Father, for those whom we haven't seen for some time face to face, um, we do, uh, again, Lord, thank you for them and do pray, uh, Lord God, that uh, you might be near to them. And uh, Lord, that you would continue to give us that sense of uh, fellowship uh, together, one with another. Uh, Lord, in all of this, we want to thank you that you are a God who is sovereign and who rules over all. Uh, Lord, perhaps that's the, the great uh, message of the Bible, one of the great messages of the Bible, certainly, uh, that you're the great King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, Father, we uh, thank you uh, that that is true. Uh, Lord, in, in ancient times, people uh, believed that well, there were all kinds of different gods, and these gods would war against one another, and sometimes one would be on top, and sometimes the other would be on top, and there was no certainty, and the gods often acted very capriciously. Uh, Father, we thank you that that is uh, not the case. And uh, Lord, over, over time, uh, uh, that view has become very unpopular. Um, and uh, many people, perhaps even most people um, nowadays, believe that there is one God who rules over all. We thank you for that, Lord. Uh, we thank you for that truth. Uh, but we thank you uh, not just that that is true, uh, but we thank you uh, that as we read the Bible, uh, we read of uh, uh, the Son of God, the divine Son of God, uh, the second person of the Trinity who came from heaven to earth, uh, so to not just rule over all, but also to become one of us. What an amazing truth that is. We thank you, therefore, Father, that you understand and you know that you, the, the, the triune God, know uh, what it is to, to be weak, know what it is to be, uh, to be human, and uh, we thank you that we have this great high priest in Jesus who sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. And therefore, Father, uh, we thank you that we have the best of both worlds. Uh, a God who rules over all. A God who sympathizes with our weaknesses. A, a God then who is powerful, as we've been singing with the children, but also a God who loves us deeply and personally and individually. So Father, we thank you for that. And we do ask, Lord, that you would show yourself to us, that we might trust you and that we might know you. Father, we thank you and commit our time again to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, before uh, Dave comes to speak to us, we're going to uh, sing uh, uh, once again, Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I wondered at your gift of life, and I'm in that place once again. I'm in that place once again. Once again I look up 
on the cross where you die. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you, once again I pour out my life. to the highest place, King of the heavens, where one day I'll bow, but for now, I marvel at this saving grace, and I'm full of praise once again, yes, I'm full of praise once again. Once again I look on the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside Once again I thank you, once again I pour out my life Thank you for the cross, thank you for the cross for the cross my As I said earlier, it's uh, great to uh, welcome Dave Lewis uh, back to our pulpit. Uh, so Dave, once you're unmuted, over to you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's not too bad, thank you. Okay, I put the earbud in because apparently the microphone is better than on my iPad, there you go. Uh, but I, I was wondering this morning, how much control you think you really have over your life uh, this morning? Um, by the wonders of modern technology, it is highly likely that as I was given the children's story to Clidach over YouTube, that I was also internationally giving a different children's story um, to the children there, because I pre-recorded one yesterday for them. We're going through the Lord's Prayer uh, with the children. So I pre-recorded that, and probably at exactly the same time, I'm appearing by the wonders of modern technology. Who would have thought that a year ago? Who would have chosen that a year ago? It's true, isn't it, that this year, 2020, has blown away any kind of illusion we have that we have any control, really, of our lives. And we have a, a glimpse of that, not just, of course, this year, but we have a glimpse of it here as well, in Acts chapter 19. There's a, a well-known old Jewish saying, man plans and God laughs. And it's so true, isn't it? Psalm 2 and Proverbs 19 seem to confirm that this is certainly got a basis in Scripture. And we've seen so many of our plans being blown out of the water this year. I'm not sure that God has laughed about this. But this year has highlighted to us that we cannot do what we want, when we want, and where we want. It is just uh, an illusion of control that we have. And we see that here in Acts chapter 19. It's the reason that I asked Mark to read from verse 21, because you see Paul planning. 
After all this happened, so Paul has been preaching for two years in Ephesus, he decides, uh, in verse 21, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, or decided in the spirit, or resolved in the spirit. Paul, the great apostle, has his plan. It is uh, a spirit-enabled plan, clearly. He decides, resolves in the spirit. So he is praying about this. He is using his, his, his apostolic gifting to do this. And yet, clearly, the great apostle Paul is still not in control. Because as Paul plans, as Paul purposes, as Paul resolves to go, well, a riot comes and changes those plans, certainly for a little while. Riot stops him. And we also see here Demetrius planning. And yet, as we'll see, what happens to his plans? What happens? Well, in verse 23, Luke records for us uh, and describes what happens here in a, in a beautiful way. About that time, there arose a great disturbance. That's not beautiful, but a good church to describe the gospel. This way of salvation, this way of life, following the one, the description, isn't it? The church, this great description, the way. And there is a great disturbance in Ephesus. Ephesus, of course, famous for the temple of Artemis, as uh, Mark read to us. Uh, it's also sometimes called uh, the, the temple of Diana. Uh, it's a statue. Uh, Diana is kind of the Roman name or how the Romans would refer to Artemis. But uh, the temple of Artemis, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Said to be far bigger than the Pantheon or the Parthian at Athens, whichever one it is. I can always mix them up between Rome and Athens, but whichever one it is, it's said to be far bigger than the Acropolis thing, uh, in Athens. So this thing is huge. And of course, it's got this famous statue of Artemis. It is famous, of course, throughout the ancient world, and it is giving Ephesus its identity. It is known for this great temple and for this great statue. And so uh, a man called Demetrius that we read of, he is a silversmith, he's an idol maker, he makes silver shrines, he makes statues of Artemis. And now, of course, he has a problem. He's looked at his annual accounts, uh, and he can see where the profit curve is trending, and it is downward. Uh, and he can see why this is happening. Less and less people are buying statues, idols of Artemis. And so he determines to do something about it. Demetrius here plans. He plans to do something. It's not just Paul that plans in this passage. Demetrius organizes and he speaks. He gets the other silversmiths. He gets uh, the others involved uh, in the spin-off trades. And uh, he's almost like a first century union activist. It's gathering really of the first ever TUC meeting. And as Demetrius gathers them, he reminds them of how much money that they are making from this business, as he describes it. They make and they sell statue. And because of the falling trade, because of that man, Paul, well, Demetrius is convincing large uh, numbers now of the silversmith to do something about it. Why? Well, because he is convinced that Paul is the problem. Paul is convincing large numbers of people away from buying our products. 
because of that man Paul and what he teaches. And so, Demetrius starts his argument, well, those citizens uh, are against the economy. Look at what it's doing to the economy. That way that Demetrius argues, we continue today. It's hurting us financially. We make our money from doing this. Paul and the way stopping our trade is stopping our money. But Demetrius doesn't stop there. He warns them that if Paul is allowed to continue, then the whole way of life for the Ephesians will change. No one will worship Artemis anymore. What's the implication? Ephesus, our great city, our great place of living, will long be forgotten. And he stirs up this mob of silversmiths. He makes them furious, and eventually there's the start of a riot. They grab two of uh, Paul's uh, colleagues. They grab uh, Gaius and Aristarchus, and they go to the theatre. This huge kind of amphitheatre there in Ephesus. Paul wants to go and help the, the, the situation, but is stopped by the other Christians there. And there is chaos in the theatre. Uh, if you've ever been uh, to Turkey in that area, it's a great place to visit. You, you start kind of at the top of Ephesus, and you work your way down to the valley. And one of the great things, great places you can stand, is in this amphitheatre, the theatre there. And I've stood there at the front, and I got my son to photograph me and video me, pretending to be the Apostle Paul preaching. Uh, of course, remembering that there is no record of Paul actually preaching in that theatre, but there you go. But uh, it, it's worth visiting. You can see the amphitheatre, it's a huge just gallery where, where you can preach. It would be great for today, actually. In the open air, you could have a huge crowd socially distant. But the crowd are there. And in the midst of the chaos, the Jews are there as well. The whole crowd, nobody really knows why they're there. The silversmiths and Demetrius are there, basically being anti-Paul and anti-Gospel. And in the midst of the chaos, the Jews push forward a spokesman, Alexander. Why? Well, in the culture of the day, the Jews would have been blamed for what's going on. We've got this pagan culture. The only thing really that is different before uh, Paul with the gospel comes is there's a synagogue there and there are Jews there. So any other religious commotion, the Jews get blamed. So what happens? Alexander is pushed forward, seemingly reluctantly, Push forward, defend our honour. Basically, tell them it's nothing to do with us. This is Paul. It's not us, Governor. Nothing to do with us. We're innocent. It's Paul that you need to do something about. However, the mob stops this from happening because they find out he's Jewish, and so they stop it. And for two hours, the crowd chant the name of Artemis. Do you ever complain about how long some of our Christian worship services last? Well, you don't have to, and we don't have to. We might sing sometimes too much in meetings, and sermons may definitely go on too long. But at least you don't have to chant the same thing for two hours. That's what the Ephesians do in the theatre. Anyway, after two hours of chanting, and two hours really of chaos, a city official comes, addresses the crowd, and calms them. And basically, he says, these people, they haven't really done anything wrong. If they have, the thing to do is to bring them to the law courts. And he calms the court, uh, the, the crowd, by saying, don't worry about Artemis. Don't worry about the temple. Don't worry about the statue. After all, he says, you can't deny her power. You can't deny her miraculous nature. She will protect the temple. You've got nothing to worry about. And so he calms the crowd by saying those things. Because the truth is, where is the temple today? It's just ruins. It's virtually kind of that much of it. And it's historically unclear. I was researching the history of the temple. It's even historically unclear when the temple was even destroyed. Nobody seems to really know. So it's history 
is unclear. And who worships or knows anything about Artemis today? But who worships Jesus Christ today? More people than ever before. You see, man plans, Demetrius plans here, but God purposes. The church grows, Artemis and its worship dies. The city official gets it so wrong, doesn't he? But what can we learn from a riot in first century Ephesus? Really, what has it got to do with us today? Well, the first thing that I want us to, to draw some attention to is this. Christianity affects culture. Christianity affects culture. The culture in Ephesus is very clearly pagan. The culture of the city is dominated by this worship of Artemis. The influence of the synagogue is low and small compared to pagan worship. The historians tell us that Artemis was a statue made of cedar wood. The court official says, of course, that uh, it all fell from the sky. But she's made of cedar wood. She's made of a tree. I doubt they used the chainsaw that I showed the children earlier, but she's a lump of wood. She was a, a fertility god. That's why one of the reasons they worshipped her. Fertility and protection were the big things that she was worshipped for. But she didn't work, of course, because she was literally wooden. And, of course, the fact that she doesn't protect the city, the temple actually is destroyed on several occasions before Paul even gets to Ephesus. This is a, a rebuilt temple. Proof, just from history, of the lack of power that this lump of wood has. But the temple worship makes Ephesus famous. It gives Ephesus its idea. It's the reason that the people came to the city. And it's also how these people make money. The silversmiths, and it's described in the NIV as workers in related trades. Clearly, this was its industry. Clearly, this was how the city doesn't just get its identity, it's how it makes its money as well. Pagan worship is incredibly important to Ephesus. And Christianity comes and affects the culture. And we shouldn't be surprised about that, especially as we read here in Ephesians. Because in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 8, we really get the key verse for the whole of the book of Acts. Uh, Ephesians, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, you will receive, uh, I think I've just lost my microphone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can still hear you, I think. You can hear me okay, Matt, yeah? Yeah, we can, yeah. Okay, it's saying power off, so there you go. Just wave if, you, if it doesn't go. Yeah, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Paul is going to the ends of the earth. Paul is taking the gospel here and we are seeing the power when the Holy Spirit comes to a city. We are seeing the difference that the Spirit makes, and it makes upon the, even the culture of a city. And so as we come to Ephesus, as we come to chapter 19, here are the implications of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit changes everything. Why? Well, because as individual lives come to Jesus Christ, so they are changed. The followers of Jesus become more like Jesus. More like him. More like the one who is so very different to everything. And so, of course, as the gospel changes people, well, the people become a church. The church grows. And as the church grows and grows, so, of course, its influence grows as well. And it affects, first of all, the way that people are spending their money. They're no longer spending their money upon statues 
and shrines and idols. Those things are now gone. And so the church's influence grows. And the city clerk thinking and saying that everything will stay the same. Well, of course it doesn't because the foundation of Ephesus is built upon, its identity is built upon the worship of Artemis, which of course doesn't last. The least thing that gives the city its identity and its industry doesn't collapse overnight. We see here the change, which is slow but inevitable, as the power of the Holy Spirit upon the gospel of Jesus Christ makes its effect. And of course it does. The gospel changes Christianity, changes culture, one person at a time, but it changes things. I was reading a, a would say fascinating, it was fascinating, it was a good article on the BBC website yesterday uh, about the Pilgrim Fathers sailing to America on the May 1st and uh, they're basically talking about the, the historical inaccuracies especially that Americans have about their, their history and how they often uh, confuse the, the influence of the Pilgrim Fathers with the influence of the Founding Fathers but this the BBC article, the big thing, he said, the big influence, the way that the Pilgrim Fathers changed already a culture that was there in America, was its Protestant work ethic. Work ethic. That drive to work for the glory of God, that drive to work hard. Uh, the, he was reflecting on the fact that Americans generally still today have very few holidays or vacations. They work very long weeks. They don't have, you know, six, seven weeks that many of us have. They have very few. Why? It comes from that Christian influence upon the culture. And you see it here in Ephesus. It's the start of it. It's already started. One apple tree in a, in a huge field doesn't really change anything, does it? But the more apple trees that grow in a field, slowly but surely that field becomes an orchard. And the more Christians that we have in a town, in a city, in a country, the more culture changes. We live in a time in 21st century Wales, Britain, where our culture has changed from a Christian culture. And its influence is waning. And we are seeing the effects of that. We'll think about that in, in a moment. And so that's the first thing. Christianity affects culture. The second thing, and we see it here really, is Christianity attracts conflict. Of course it does. We naturally reject change, don't we? And as Christianity affects culture, and as the culture starts to change, so there is rejection of change. Even those who say that they love change often complain when that change is something that they don't like. Always remember uh, preaching in a church that is many miles away from us, and uh, you won't know, but I do. And uh, it was a slightly different church than our kind of normal constituency. I was asked to preach there because I had relatives there. And uh, they, I asked for an order service at the beginning, and they said, oh, we, we just, we just song. Just change anything. Whatever you want to change, just change. And they give me a list of about kind of 20 songs. You didn't chant for two hours, but it was a huge list of songs. And uh, they said, just, just do whatever you want. We change doesn't bother us in the sleep. Just no service, two services are the same. And so I, I did what I did and then preached. And, and at the end of the service, someone came up to me. And they said, well, normally we have. And so I changed things, and yet they didn't like it. Even though I was told, well, you can do whatever you want. You see, we don't like change, do we? And the world and Satan does not like people changing, especially when they are more like the Lord Jesus. And they try to get rid of Jesus. And they influence, they got rid of him, remember, by crucifying him. And we shouldn't be surprised when they try to get rid of the influence of Christianity. Today. There is nothing new under the sun. Jesus, the healer, 
the miracle worker, the one who had such a beneficial impact upon Jerusalem and the surrounding region, and yet to get rid of him. We live today, as I mentioned earlier, in a day when we have the benefits of a Christian culture in the West, but we are trying to get rid of the foundation block. It's one of the reasons why our culture is changing and shifting and why there is so much confusion and so many uh, kind of competing voices at this time and why we seem to have in the West a polarization, particularly of liberalism and conservatism, of the right, the far right and far left, and those kind of things. And the confusion has come mainly because we want the benefits and the blessings of a Christian culture without the Christianity that goes with it. Uh, Tom Holland has uh, recently written a very helpful book called Dominion. Tom Holland is a, is a historian. He's not yet a Christian. He is clearly very sympathetic to Christianity. And he charts the, the dominion, as it were, the rise of Christian thought and the rise of Christian influence and the rise of Christian, we could say, culture. And certainly the effect that Christianity has had upon the West. And he shows us many of the things that we today, Christianly, but, but just in the West, in the way that we live, many things that we take for granted come from our Christian foundation and history and past. But we live in a day, it's been called, isn't it, the cancel country. We live in a day of cancelling kind of our history. What are people doing? Well, in many ways, they're trying to get rid of that foundation block of Christianity. Uh, there was a, a great interview that a uh, secular uh, atheist gave with, uh, or had with, with Tom Holland. Uh, and uh, this atheist was saying, I, you know, for the life of me, I can't think of one benefit that Christianity has given 21st century kind of the West and culture. And Tom Holland, who's not a Christian, off the top of his head, gave seven things very quickly that Christianity has given us. Equality, human rights, all these things that we take for granted today, just off the top of his head, he gave. You see, we have the blessings and benefits, but the culture wars are trying to get rid of the Christian foundation. And we see it, don't we, in the, with the statues that are being ripped down. We saw it with a, a little bit of uh, the arguments over whether we should sing and have those songs in the proms the other week. But of course, it was the Christian culture which led in the Christianity of Wilberforce and his supporters and those who encouraged him got rid of the slave trade. And because Britannia ruled the waves, we could enforce that for abolition of the slave trade. And we did that because of Christianity. That is the basis, the fact that we are made in the image of God and the influence of Christianity which led that. Now today we are swimming with the tide of paganism, or are you and I swimming against the tide of paganism? Because it's easy for us to criticize Demetrius and the mob. Their job and culture are being eroded by the, by the influence of Christianity. But where is the conflict today? Why are we not facing conflict today? Is it because we are not Christ-like enough? Is it because we are not acting as salt and light in the culture in which we live? Are we swimming with the tide of our pagan materialistic culture? Or are we swimming against it? But are the object of our worship in Swansea? What is our temple of Artemis in Swansea today? Is it sport? Is it language? What is it that identifies you as someone who comes from Swansea, who lives in this culture? When you're on holiday, remember holidays when you used to go abroad? Well, when you're on holiday and you're talking by the pool or wherever, and somebody asks you, Where are you from? And you say, and, and what is it that identifies you? Too often we, we say, This is what I do, and, and we get our job. 
what is it that defines you? We see it so very clearly in Ephesus. The culture changes. Conf uh, confrontation comes. Are you being confronted because of your Christianity? And what happens when the Lord convicts you and me of something in our culture that we are putting before him? What is our idol? What is our temple of Artemis in our lives? What are you and I putting in our lives that we can't live without? Demetrius and the others, they're not subtle, are they? It's very visible, Artemis. The temple is visible. The money that they get from what they make is visible, but we can be so subtle with our objects of worship. How much of our Welsh, British, Western, Swansea culture will stand? And so thirdly, finally this morning, Christianity, culture, and you. Because really, we are called, aren't we, to be salt and light where God has put us. But God hasn't really called us to change the culture. Changing the culture is a byproduct of what God does. You see, according to 2 Peter 3, 18, our goal is to be growing in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Our aim is to be more like Christ. Paul says, doesn't he, imitate me as I imitate Christ. The byproduct of more and more people being more and more Christ-like is that the culture will inevitably change. But that is not our goal. We're not to try and make the, the culture of Britain more Christian so that it's an easier place to live. I think that's the temptation. Now, if only we could go back 50, 100 years, it would be easier to be a Christian. That, that's not what we're called to. We are called to be more like Jesus. We are called to be more Christian. We are called to be salt and light as he is wherever he has put us. We are to spend more time eating the tax collectors and sinners. We are to live out the sermon of the night. We are to live by the Spirit so that we will produce the fruit of the Spirit. So that when other people who work with us and live with us and live by us and speak with us and everything else, we'll see in love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And the more that people see that and live like that, well, of course, the culture will inevitably change as a result of being more like Jesus Christ. You see, the city has changed because Paul and the others live for Christ in a Christ-like way. And they tell others of the wonder of Jesus Christ. They lived and they spoke. They shone like stars in the night sky as they held up. And as a result, the culture in Ephesus changes. You see, our concern is not really to change culture. Our big concern is to live for Christ. Our big concern is to be the very best ambassadors for Christ that you and I can possibly be. That your plan. You see, we start off by saying that Paul and Demetrius both knew the riot comes in the midst of all these plans. What does it change? Ephesus is just a, a ruin that is worth visiting. But the legacy of Paul and the Christian church is around the globe. Why? It's the power of God. God is building his church. That is the plan of God. God's plans always come to fruition. And as God builds his church, will we see the culture around us changing? Well, let's pray that God would do that in our day, that as he builds his church, the whole world would be changed. Amen. Thank you, Dave. Well, we're going to uh, sing a, a hymn uh, that uh, uh, reminds us of the position, if you like, of uh, the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the name we honour. Jesus is the name we praise. <laughs>
let's uh, close in prayer. Father God, we thank you that uh, Jesus does indeed rule over all. And because of that, uh, we know that there can frequently be a, a clash uh, between uh, Christianity and culture, or perhaps more accurately, between Christ and culture. And Father, we thank you for the uh, great influence that Christianity has been uh, over our own culture over so many uh, uh, years, centuries even. Father, we thank you for that. And we do pray, Lord, that you would help us in our generation to be an influence for good uh, in our own culture. We thank you that the fact that Jesus uh, reigns over all and rules over all gives us great hope. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, Christ will prevail. Uh, we thank you for the hope uh, that that uh, gives us uh, in life and in death. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the hope that it gives us in sadness and uh, even when we mourn. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the hope that it gives us uh, as uh, we make our plans, uh, Lord, uh, not knowing whether those plans will come to fruition, uh, but also, Lord, being confident that even when they don't, uh, Jesus remains Lord of all and in control. And therefore, Father, we thank you that we can trust you uh, even when we don't know or understand the future. Uh, Father, help us to live this out and to bow the knee and worship our Lord of all, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.